Hi guys, um, welcome to this podcast. Uh, basically, I'm going to just do this uh, like a, a minute kind of intro to the main podcast because I've listened back to it. Um, it's a biggie. It's a long one. Um, it's it might not be for everybody. Um, it uh, and that's fine. I totally get it. Um, it's something that's incredibly raw for me. Um, and just to warn you, it's very emotional, um, pretty much from the start. So, uh, I just ask you to, obviously, if you, if you, if you do listen, just to bear with me, um, uh, it's, it also gets very intense as well. So, um, you might want to, you might want to pour yourself a stiff drink before you get stuck into this one. Um, you might want to also just listen to it in two parts. I'm not too sure. As I said, I don't think it's going to be for everyone. Um, and I totally get that, but, um, yeah, as I say, just to warn you, it is very emotional. Um, I just also want to say, like, you know, life is not easy. We've all got our own personal problems. Um, I'm just, sort of, as I say, obviously, just sharing mine, basically. Um, and I've I've thought long and hard about this. In fact, I showed my girlfriend um, just the intro, and I sort of said, you know, I do cry on this podcast, and and I was kind of feeling quite embarrassed about that um, and very ashamed. Um, but we both kind of agreed, and it's I think. I, I was feeling this uh, that basically if I wasn't gonna if I was if if I didn't release this I'd I'd be sort of giving in to that um, feeling of being ashamed. So I am embarrassed. Um, you're gonna hear me cry. Uh, I am a very I'm very I'm very embarrassed by that. Um, but I've got my reasons to be embarrassed. And um, anyway, look here it is. Um, I hope you enjoy it. As I say, it's it's taken me a lot of sort of a lot of guts I suppose to kind of release this but um uh as I said I'm not looking for any sympathy I just want you to know how it is basically so anyway without further ado here it comes enjoy right hi guys welcome to podcast three um I'm not gonna lie my heart is beating uh, it's pounding actually uh, I've got sweaty palms uh my legs are shaking um and I'm going to open up with you in this podcast. Um, apologies if I get a bit emotional. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, my gambling addiction um, that I experienced in my 20s. Oh, I don't know if this will make the, uh, the podcast. Um, anyway, I'm not here to, um, to have a pity party. Uh, Jesus. Um, anyway, I'm going to just talk about some news and announcements first. Talk about some positives um, and then uh, talk about... Um, Jesus. Whew. Sorry. Um, talk about um, my uh, addiction to gambling. Um, sorry. Sorry, I'm, in, I'm incredibly nervous. Um, I didn't think I would. Uh, I didn't think I would be like this. Actually, um, I thought up until now the podcast had been a bit of a laugh and a bit of a joke, and I've been, you know, not really thought about it. But um, <clears throat> this has been uh, a really long journey for me. Um, it continues to be uh, so quite a hard thing for me to talk about and open up with uh, for years I've been very secretive and um, yeah I just want to tell you how it is so I apologize for that little blip there with the tears wasn't expecting that at all um, and uh, I don't know if this will be a half an hour or if I'll make this you know if, how long this will last um, it uh, I could talk quite heavily about this um, anyway as I say, we're going to talk about some news and announcements uh, first before we talk about the gambling. Uh, sorry, I feel like an absolute idiot crying on a podcast. Um, anyway, so news and announcements first. Uh, it seems really weird to talk about this. Uh, anyway, well, first things first. Um, uh, news and announcements. Basically, yeah, uh, the podcast is now live on Spotify and other platforms. Um, so I've listened and... 
we you know we're going to do this so um yeah you know you can listen to it on spotify i know um youtube was a bit of a nightmare because obviously you know you have to be in the app to continue listening if you're on your phone and if you close it down you, you obviously stop listening so yeah you can listen to me now on spotify um and i would really love it if you could leave me a review or a comment that would be great especially on uh, youtube as well um helps the algorithms and lets youtube know that um, you're listening and you're hopefully enjoying it and taking something from it. Um, other bits and pieces. Um, well, behind the scenes have been very busy. Um, I've spoken with a very good friend who uh, or ha- happens to conveniently be a brand manager uh, for global um, companies, and we're having a good discussion. So, um, yeah, he was sort of saying, "What you know? What's your mission? What's your message?" Um, and at the moment, I think it's been quite mixed. I think. Um, uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, you've got cooking videos, you've got me, you know, going on vlogs, going to the beach and um, me talking about gambling addictions on podcasts. So it's a little bit mixed. Um, ultimately, it's really just for me to uh, enjoy myself and hopefully you can um, you can laugh, you can cry uh, at the channel, at me. Um, yes, hopefully it's entertaining. I hope, if anything, it just comes across as real and um, honest. So yeah, my mission at the moment is a bit confused. I'm still not entirely sure what it is, um, but I'm sure it will kind of figure itself out. Um, Other things uh, I've been doing, I've been um, writing, well, I haven't really been writing it, but my friend has. We're going to hopefully write a radio show, a kind of comedy uh, sketch kind of radio show. Um, Hopefully more on that in uh, the future. and uh, I've been asked to collaborate with another um, podcaster uh, talking about men's mental health. Um, so that would be great to, to go on to his show. Um, and good news, in terms of the stats, I've doubled the number of subscribers. So um, nice one, guys. Thank you. It really means a lot. Um, Right. Anyway, that's been, yeah, it's been a five minute intro. I don't know if I'm going to keep the crying on. I'm really, as I say, really sorry for doing that. I've researched this um, quite a lot. I've watched a lot of um, uh, documentaries, quite a few bits and pieces. Uh, I'll leave links to all of these below in the description um, about gambling addiction, by the way. And um, I've looked at lots of facts. Um, I've looked through my bank accounts, which I previously had never really done. Um, stretching back many years. So um, basically, I just want to prefix this podcast, actually, before we do anything else. Um, So I just want to say that not everyone that gambles is a gambling addict. Um, It's a bit like, you know, not everyone that drinks, you know, sorry, you know, it's not, if you you have a beer, it doesn't make you an alcoholic. Um, So I just want to say that uh, before we kind of crack on. So, so look, you know, if you, if I do get it, gambling is fun. Um, you know, if you can obviously stay in control, which a lot of, you know, a lot of people can, um, that's, that's cool. You know, I'm the first one. I I do love a day at the races and, um, things like that. Uh, but gambling for me was, uh, I was going to say still is, but I've, I have genuinely stopped, um, with, with my issues as it were. I'm sure they'll still run deep forever. Um, but, yeah, anyway, I'm going to sort of, I've laboured that, laboured that point. Um, so look, yeah, this is going to be a very personal, uh, personal story, uh, an account of my, uh, gambling addiction. Um, sorry, <laughs> again, uh, getting the old tears again. Um, and it basically, it lasted from about, uh, 22 years old to 29 years old. So it's, it's very, uh, raw. Um, I do still like, I will have a bet occasionally on the horse racing, um, perhaps the Grand National or go to the, go to the horses. The horses has never been a a problem for me. Um, it was more to do with like roulette and, uh, casinos and things like that, um, and online gambling. But, um, anyway, so I'm going to tell lots of stories, lots of anecdotes, um, about my addiction. Um, and really this is to raise awareness for, um, problem gambling, uh, especially amongst men. Basically, um, very recently, well, very recently, um, a chap called Lee uh, from Newbury, uh, who was our plumber, actually. I didn't know him personally, but um, he was uh, a lovely young man, mid-30s, polite. 
he went to um he went to the same school as me park house um he recently took his own life and i'm led to believe and and you can correct me if i'm wrong i'm sorry if anyone's listening to this and this is incorrect but i'm led to believe strongly that it was to do with gambling um uh, another man I sort of know, or a friend of a friend, he also recently took his own life uh, to do with gambling. Um, and I want to, yeah, just to raise awareness about gambling addiction and problem gambling uh, amongst men. Um, basically, um, um, basically, gambling addicts are three... Um, three to four um, times more likely to attempt to kill themselves. Oh, Jesus. Um, uh, whoo, than any other type of addict. Um, uh, research in Sweden says that gambling addicts are 15 times more likely to take their own lives than the uh, general population. So, whoo, this podcast is... Uh, is dedicated to Lee and all other people that have taken their own lives because of uh, because of gambling. Um, I'm sorry about this. I really um, I don't even know if I want to release this, but oh, because it's got tears in it, and um, I just feel a bit stupid. Um, anyway, I'm sorry. This is probably like a Gamblers Anonymous session. Um, for those listening in, um, but you know, it is what it is. Right. Come on, put yourself together. Um, yeah, men, men are seven point times, seven and a half times more likely to, uh, than women to be classed as problem gamblers. So, um, so anyway, I could, I could sit here and read through a bunch of stats, um, which are very interesting. Again, I'll probably link them in the description below or so, you know, so just bullet point them or whatever. Um, this kind of gets very political, it can get very political. Um, it's obviously to do with society. Um, there's a lot of economic issues in here to do with legislation and who's to blame and uh, and whatnot. But I, I will just say one fact, actually. In the UK, um, I think 2018, um, the gambling industry was worth £14.4 billion to the, um, in the UK. It was worth that much as an industry. Uh, the UK government took 2.9 billion um, from gambling, sort of, I guess from the taxation and whatnot. Um, so it's worth a lot of money to the government. And it's um, it's only in 2013 that uh, problem gambling was seen as, um, seen as an addiction, uh, just the same as alcohol and drugs misuse. Um, it is an addiction. It is uh, hardwired into gamblers. Um, whether you win or lose, they've done MRI brain scans. And um, basically, whether you win or you're just participating, it's pretty much just the same hit of dopamine on the brain. Um, so, you know, the, th the whole kind of ethos of like the thrill of the chase or like, oh, just I'll just, you know, go to I'll have one more bet or I'll win this time or or whatever. Or it was a near miss. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, look, I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to crack on and just tell you my story, kind of like how I got into it, how it started um, and sort of how it developed and uh, the kind of downfall to it, really. Um, as I say, I've got I've got tons of notes. I've actually got five pages worth of bullet points here, um, but I'm just going to speak from the heart and um, just tell it how it is, uh, tell you my story and... Um, you know, this is my own. Um, this is my own private life. I don't know why I'm sharing it with others. I think it's just, hopefully, just to raise, as I say, just to raise awareness. And um, if any of you are going through anything similar, um, that I just want you to know that um, you're not the only one. Um, so here we go. <laughs> Right, how did it start? How did I start gambling? Um, well, I think I think most, you know, gamblers will tell you, will always remember their first winning bet. And um, my first winning bet was on, uh, was in Stan James in Newbury. I used to go during sick form. 
um, with some mates uh, during our free periods. Uh, we used to go to McDonald's. It's a bit like the in-betweeners. Um, and then nip down to Stan James and, you know, we used to do like a football accumulator um, and, uh, you know, might sort of bet on the horses. And I, I wouldn't have a clue what I was doing. And I, I remember one friend, I won't name him because it will feel like I'm blaming him. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm really not. But he was playing um, the machines. I think they're called uh, FOBTs, um, fixed odd betting, fixed odds betting terminals. And um, basically on these machines, you know, got your like casino games like blackjack and roulette or whatever. And I was like, what, what are you doing, mate? What, what, what are you doing here? He said, oh, look, what you do is you put a pound in and you have, you can pick five numbers. They're worth 20p each. And it was on the roulette. And he went, look, you just scatter them around and pick a few numbers and, you know, and the, the roulette wheel spins and, uh, well, you see if your number comes out. So I was like, okay, sounds good. So I put a pound in and um, probably every gambling addict has probably thought this, uh, but the worst thing that could happen to me was that I won. From that pound, I won £7.20, which for someone that had never won a bet, before was astronomical that was huge i you know seven times as much as my money or whatever you know however the maths goes um so that was that i was like okay this is cool this is brilliant um and actually i've just realized actually throughout sick form it was pretty bad um when i was about 18 um i remember uh yeah fuck it i'll just share this bit with you whatever um basically i uh, I, have, I haven't got a criminal record, but I have been arrested before. And um, basically it was for jumping a taxi. <laughs> uh, anyway, so it, I remember my dad rung me up. He said, Alex, the police are here. Like, what the fuck, basically? Get back now. So I was like, okay, all right. Um, fully fully knowing what was like what was to come, I was like, shit, it was because I freaking ran away from that taxi, wasn't it? Um, anyway... But guess where I was? I was pumping money into a machine in Labbrooks. Um, basically, at the time, I, I was refereeing. Um, I'll probably talk about refereeing in another podcast. And um, basically, at the time, I was earning quite a lot of cash in hand from refereeing, from uh, like weekend games and midweeks. I mean, honestly, I was earning about 100, 150 quid a week, a lot of that in cash. I think I worked at Waitrose as well, the old uh, shelf stacker. And, um, yeah, we, you know, used to just go down and, and we'd go down on my own. We'd go with friends at first, but then we'd go down on my own. It would just be me and the machine and I'd just play the roulette. That's all I would play. Um, just, you know, obviously at the time I didn't realise, but that was just the start of the addiction, really. Um, or, or, you know, kind of training the brain to kind of get hooked to this. Because that's the thing about gambling is like win or lose, you want to go back for more. And in fact, even when I've lost, it's still not discouraged me. You know, I'll go and chase my bets. And I think every problem gambler basically will will try and chase chase the bets. So um, anyway, let's let's move on to the next kind of the next bit. So I didn't really do it. Then I went to university and I didn't really do it that much. You know, being a student, didn't really have much money. I'm sure I would have bet it. I, mean, I can't really remember specifically, but I'm sure I would have, you know, continued to bet. But just I didn't really do it. To be honest with you, didn't have much money. Um... So basically, you know, I've, I've, I've thought about this a long time and I thought, you know, is it in my blood gambling? Um, my granddad's twin, Stan, he was, um, Grandad Gordon, his twin Stan was a big, big gambler. Um, so I, I thought, is this heder like her hereditary? Is that how to say it? Um, but I, I don't know. I think it can affect uh, lots of people. Apparently in this country, there's a two million people at risk to problem gambling. Um, and it's gone up by a third uh, those that are actually problem gamblers to about half a million, roughly. Um, so anyway, I kind of digress, but yeah, I used to think, you know, is it my blood? You know, is it because I'm from Newbury? It's a horse racing tradition. Um, you know, we've got Lambourne stables around the corner. We've got Hike Clear stud, Kings Clear stud, uh, the Queen's horses around here. You know, you, you uh, uh, pretty much most people in Newbury have got a connection to the horse racing, um, or, you know, at the very least you've been, you know, to, to a day at the races. So I kind of thought, oh, is this just natural? This is, is this what it, you know, it's what it's about. Um, I remember going into a betting shop with my mate at, again, about 18, and I couldn't believe it. There was a guy, um, a guy at the, um, at school, one of the teacher's brother, 
um, keen sportsman, and he was on the roulette, and I couldn't believe it. I looked, it's like Jesus Christ. He's just won four. His ticket. He's just won four hundred quid. I couldn't believe it. And and he walked to the cashier to to obviously get the money, and he didn't even break not didn't even break a smile. Didn't look happy. No emotion at all. I was like, shit. Why is he not happy? That's like that's a bit odd. Um, and of course, little did you know, little did I know that actually, you know, problem gamblers basically it's to do with the dopamine in your brain, which is to do with the, the sort of the emotional side of things. And um, as I say, it, it kind of just triggers, well, it's got the same effect as losing. So everything is just like balanced out, you know, you kind of get unemotional. So you sort of think to yourself, you kid yourself, and you thought, well, that's good to be a gambler, isn't it? Because at least I can control myself. If I'm winning, it means I, I still feel kind of as almost like the same as when I was losing, you know, it's all right. I'm in control of this because I don't feel emotional. But little do I know, it's to do with, you know, addiction. Um, as I say, it's it's just as addictive as, as drugs or alcohol misuse, you know. Um, but the thing about gambling is it's, in, it's, it's invisible. You you can't tell a gambler. Uh, maybe apart from the odd mood, mood swing. Um, but you can't really, you know, it's invisible. You can't, you can tell a, someone if they've got problems with drugs. Or you can tell someone if they've got problems with alcohol. Um but you can't really tell someone if they've got a problem with gambling. Um, with ga- you know, gamblers sort of become incredibly good at lying, incredibly good at lying and, and telling fibs. And you know, so it's it's not really the behaviour. If you think, if you suspect someone that's gambling and has got issues, you won't be able to tell by their behaviour. But it's to do with the harm that it causes. So, you know, if you are looking at someone that's got an issue, then my recommendation would be to look at their bank account look at their statements and just have a flick through and just see what's coming in what's going out and I'll talk about that in a minute as my story develops because as I say I recently just checked my bank account uh, statements and it was incredibly embarrassing anyway oh just gonna take a bit of a breather as I say I already feel this podcast might be quite a biggie so I don't know if it'll be in two parts or what what not but um should we have a bit of uh I don't know if we're going to have a bit of music or maybe I'll just sort of talk about my surroundings. But I'm in an undisclosed location. There's quite a lot of people walking around me. I'm in the car again. It's very green. It's very warm. I've typically parked up in a spot, all naughty, naughty. Uh, but I am going to go for a run in a little bit, so that's my excuse. Uh, but parked up in a location that's incredibly warm. I've got the windows kind of edged down a little bit. So I'm conscious of walkers, you know, going past that social conscience of like, or were they looking in or, you know, are they looking at me thinking, mate, you should, you know, this isn't essential travel, is it? But um, I class it as essential. Anyway, um, should we carry on? Yeah, let's carry on. Um, so basically, uh, my gambling addiction kind of picked back up in 2012, the Olympic year. Um, I was working in central London. I was 22 years old, finished university, got a shirt and tie job. And uh, I was earning 26 grand a year, which, you know, by any, well, for me at the time was a huge amount. And well, now actually, funny enough, having, uh, you know, looked at my earnings, that's probably still don't get close to that. So yeah, big amount of money. Anyway, so I was, I was working in central London in Victoria, uh, living alone, um, well, living uh, five days a week at a crazy Irish woman's flat in um, Belgravia. And uh yeah, it would walk to work or whatever, and I would just be bored shitless. So at lunchtime, I would kind of go down to, if you know Victoria, there's a place that's a real famous, like, I don't know if it's famous, but you can get a baguette. Tell, if you're listening, mate, you'll know exactly where I mean, because we worked at the same place. But um, you get a nice baguette, and it's like this little cobbled street in Victoria, near Victoria Station. Was it St. James's? Anyway, getting sidetracked. Basically, there was a William Hills in there, and I would go there at lunch, bored, and just watch people gamble. I would be one of those voyeurs, you know, with the hover around the machines and would just watch. And, I, you know, you've got people there worth a lot of, you know, probably earn a lot of money. And I'd see people win big and I'd see people lose big. And at the time, I didn't bet. At the time, I would just watch. I would just watch. And I was almost like trying to kind of create a system in my mind of like, well, well he's doing that. He's betting on this number. He does this after this happens. And of course, by the way, this is a random game. This is a random machine. It's complete, utter chance. There's no way to know what's going to come up next, okay? It's just ridiculous. So chance-based games, by the way, like roulette, 
uh, bingo, slot machines, um, stuff like that. Anyway, so it was the Olympic year, so it was quite a kind of buzzy time to be in London. And um, I was bored, like I say. So in, in the evenings, I would... Uh, it was especially in the summer. I would, I would basically go and frequent the casinos in Piccadilly, around Leicester Square. So I would walk in. Some of them you don't even need memberships. You just have to flash your ID and off you go. And again, I would just watch. I would be watching. Was it the Olympics and it was it the Euros as well? And I remember I would just have a couple of beers to myself, watch a few people on the tables, and you know not really do much really I was just kind of soaking it all up the atmosphere of casino I thought oh god I'm, I'm the bollocks here I'm cool you know like who am I you know swagging around I've got money in the bank it's like I'm in central London I'm young I'm trendy you know I just felt like the bollocks you know and um I just love the buzz of a casino and, and I get it if you're not a, a you know problem gambler that you'll be um you know I do I do get it it's a good night out you've got uh it's quite um exclusive it's entertaining um you can dress up um you can have a lot of fun so I, I get it you know and I was kind of lured in you know the flashing lights and and whatnot um anyway so basically it would it was like my training that was kind of my training year um anyway I quit my job uh, I didn't really enjoy it and I went back to Newbury to live with my parents about 22 23 and I set up this thing called Hot Shots Football which I know quite a few listeners Will know about because you played at Hot Shots Football, which was a men's six-a-side league, uh, like a social league, and um, it was well, it was a business for me. I, I used to make uh, some money. Perhaps we'll talk about that again um, in another podcast. Uh, by the way, guys, we're definitely going over half an hour. I apologise. This is going to be a biggie. Um, so uh, yeah, so I went back and set up Hot Shots. I started teaching the drums. Again, would sort of, you know, sporadically gamble a little bit. And then basically, fast forward to 2013, I moved to Tooting with um, a couple of good friends from university. And um, Tom and Louie, big shout out to you guys. And then Steph as well. Um, she uh, was from Newbury. So, yeah, we lived together in Tooting. And December that year, I was living my dream. I was like, I was self-employed. I'd uh, started teaching drum lessons in Newbury. I was kind of commuting back every couple of days or whatever. Um, and I was kind of, I was debt free. I get I would get paid lump sums of money, which was very dangerous for me. Uh, you know, like drum tuition, sort of paid, you know, six weeks up in front in, in advance. Uh, I, had week, I had money coming in from Hot Shots every week, which turned out to basically be a gambling fund. I'm really sorry, guys. It's, it's true. It was just like... Fucking hell, sorry guys, that's that's horrible. You you know, you played in this league with me for six, seven years and, and you know, I was basically just pissing out the wall. Um anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a revelation. Um as I say, it's gonna be very honest. Um and um yeah, so December I was living the dream. I, I went to Thailand. I was just on a whim uh, with my mate um Hells. She was in Australia, she's like, any have you any of you fancy joining me in Thailand? I was like, Yeah, let's do it. And uh, just booked flights and off I went. And I, I had money in the back pocket. I was working two, three days a week. I had loads of time on my hands. I was living the dream. It was like, this is great. I'm 23. I'm working for myself. I've got loads of money. Well, you know, by my standards. And uh, it's all rosy. Anyway, it started to go pear shape. Turn of the new year. 2014 was a big pear shaped year for me. Um, Basically, through boredom, I started to kind of go to the casinos. So um, I would lie to my housemates. I would come back from drum teaching on a Monday evening, and um, Tinder was a kind of thing. Tinder just kind of got off 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 uh, the ground. So it was all very exciting, you know, going on Tinder dates, and you know, back when it was cool and fun. Um, anyway, I was I was going on Tinder dates and whatnot, and and quite a few Tinder dates. And um, anyway, the point of this is. I would get back about 10 o'clock at night and at my, I would say, oh, I'm just nipping out. And they'd be like, where are you going? At, you know, Monday night at half 10. I'd be like, oh, I'm just off to see a girl, you know, the girl I, you know, dated the other week. That was complete, utter bollocks. Basically, I was getting a tube into central London and I was now starting to bet in the casinos. And when I say bet, it started off with, OK, I'll bet 30 quid, I'll, you know, spread it around on the roulette table. Then it became 50 quid. Okay, I'll go in with 50 quid. Um, then I'd start to go in, right, I've got 100 quid, I'll spend 100 quid here. 
So I'm just going to talk about some of my winnings and losses, uh, wins and losses, because um, I've looked through my bank accounts and it spells quite a difficult uh, picture for me and uh, I'm quite embarrassed by it, uh, but these are just cold hard facts. So in March 2014, in a period of three days, I gambled and lost a thousand pounds. I think that is, and by the way, I've just looked at one bank account, I've got two. Um, I think that was a lot of uh, casino gambling. Basically, I would go into, as I say, central London. I had at the time a business, quote unquote, business account for my Hot Shots football um, project, and I had money coming in. And I would bet anywhere between, as I say, 100 to 300 pounds uh, a night. Uh, that actually rose to about 600 pounds. Uh, at times because I was ha- I had a business account so it meant I could get more money out basically um, but because I had a two accounts had two debit cards I could just double up sort of thing so I could just start getting cash out left right and center and then you can do it on your card as well so it's a bit of a double whammy um, so in May on the 6th of May 2000 it was getting worse it was getting a lot lot worse I was starting to bet online as well so on the 6th of May 2014 I in that day in that just that day, I lost fifteen hundred pounds. Um, but then I experienced some big wins as well. Um, I remember at the time I was earning, as I say, earning a lot of cash from drum lessons. People would pay me in cash as well, um, so I was regularly going to the bank. Um, but I remember some of my big wins. Um, I remember walking out from a casino um, after playing the roulette. Um, I had you know, a couple of special numbers. Come on to that in a moment. Um, but I came out with two and a half grand um, and what they do is they seal it in a bag and it's just 50 it's new it's pretty much brand new 50 pound notes and I can't tell you how fucking good that felt seriously I felt like the bollocks I thought yeah I've done this I've beat the system like I'm winning I'm a winner you know um, I am competitive I used to play football as a kid um, I'm gonna sound like a Sunday league football oh, I used to be good at football but I was half decent um, and played uh, for uh, a club, a professional club, their youth team or, you know, youth set up or whatever. Uh, anyway, where am I going with this? Basically, you know, footballers, um, a lot of footballers that uh, retire um, suffer from depression and big gambling problems. And I just wonder if it's something to do with the football. I don't know. I haven't got the answer um, with to do with self-esteem or to do with competitiveness or whatnot. But at that point, when I walked out with two and a half grand, I thought, yeah, I'm a winner. I am a winner. This is great. Uh, and then a couple of days later, I won 1,500 quid. It was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, again, thought I was the bollocks. However, this is the story. And this is a true story. Um, I want to let you know of that. This is about being in a bubble. So when you're a gambler or you've got a problem gambling, nothing really matters apart from you and the machine or you and the roulette wheel, the spinning wheel, which I was just completely transfixed by completely transfixed by in june 2014 i went to the hippodrome casino um in leicester square piccadilly and my special number black 17 uh came out twice in a row now black 17 was like my baby i would just be focused on that number i bet on other numbers but that was my number and i couldn't believe my luck it came in twice in a row i remember there was this Chinese guy who's a bit of a hustler. It's, it's very close to Chinatown. Um, there's not a, a lot of Chinese, the Chinese population would be in there. And this hustler came up to me and he would sort of, he obviously didn't have much money, but he would sort of say, you know, you, I think you should bet here or bet there. And I bet on 17 again and I sort of increased my bet. So I, I can't remember how much I won, but I won a fuckload of money. And it was like fucking hell. I was just completely, utterly glazed over. And I gave him a tip. I gave him five quid tip, I handed him a chip and the security came over to me. And it was at this point, um, I wasn't really thinking straight. And I went, oh, hang on a minute. I recognise that music playing in the background. There was a live band on basically um, in the casino. And I remember the guy, you know, said, oh, you know, can't give this guy a tip. We're going to have to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, typically sort of just apologise and very politely. And, you know, and he was sort of, oh, okay, right. Okay, don't do it again. Blah, blah, blah. I just went, I recognise that um, band that are playing. Um, Because it was that tune, it was, Wanna be a lover. Um, 
And I was like, who is that? And he went, oh, it's Prince. Um, I was like, what, the Prince? And he was like, yeah, yeah, Prince, he's doing, um, he's doing a gig. And, you know, I should have been, as a, well, a quote-unquote musician or drum team, I, I was, I should have gone and had a look. I didn't. I just was like, oh, okay, cool. Went straight back to the table. Didn't give a shit. Didn't give a monkeys. Um, so, yeah, it was just getting getting pretty bad. Um, anyway, uh, where are we? Where are we? Um, I've got a lot more to say. A lot more to say. Um, I don't know at this point if I'm going to stop there, actually. Um, no, I'm going to carry on. We're going to carry on. Don't know if, as I say, don't know if this will be in two parts or whatnot. I'm getting incredibly hot in the car. Uh, I want to go for a run, but uh, uh, I'm like, uh, got lots to say. Um, I'm in the groove. Yeah, screw it. We'll just go for it. I'm sorry if, if you're still listening. Fair play to you. Uh, by the way, this is mostly aimed at men. So ladies, if you're listening, apologies. Um, I don't know. It might affect you as well. Statistically, it'd be more likely to be men. Um, anyway, so yeah, what would I do? Like my routine would be basically I would go to this casino. I would feel bloody cool. I remember seeing some footballers in there. I'm a Bournemouth fan. I saw some Bournemouth footballers in there um, once. I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like fucking bollocks. People were looking at me. I was dressing. I was wearing my best clothes. Um, and my routine would basically win or lose. It was like win or lose. We're on the booze. Win or lose. I would always go and have a pint. I would never really drink whilst I gamble, which was interesting. Again, it was a, this sort of mechanism of like, oh, I'll definitely be in control if I'm not drinking. In, you know, some respects, I wish the bloody did. Um, but I'd always have a beer after. I would always treat myself. I'd have a beer. I'd have a pint of beer, a uh, pint of lager, and then I would walk over to Chinatown. I'd get uh, boiled rice and barbecue duck, um, and then I would get a taxi home. And the taxi would the taxi would cost me anywhere between thirty to fifty quid. Again, didn't give a shit. If I'd even if I'd lost five, six hundred quid or whatever it was, um, I'd still get a taxi home. I was just like, well, fuck it. I've spent so much money um, on on gambling. Then why not? You know. Um, anyway, getting some getting some funny looks. People <laughs> people are giving me the eyebrows of like, oh dear, why are you in the car? You you shouldn't be here. Um, Another story, saw a French black uh, French blackjack player. Uh, he was dressed really cool. He had like earrings and like rings. I watched him and I watched him all night. Uh, just, just from afar, I was obviously on my own table or whatever. And uh, he had loads of pink chips. And I think pink chips mean you've got a thousand pounds. And he must have had seriously about six or seven of these. Um, and he lost the fucking lot. He lost the bloody lot. And that was in the space of about five or six hours. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever, I'd rarely leave the table. I'd go for a go for a quick toilet, toilet break, maybe have a cigarette, um, well, to try and kind of chill out, um, and then you know come back to the table and just carry on carry on gambling. I mean, it's really hard for me at this point to kind of talk about how I felt, um, but you know I felt like shit. Um, you know, actually how I felt, but you know I felt ashamed. I felt um, disgusted with myself. I felt. I'd lost all self. I, I sort of became a loser. I, my mentality was, I'm just a worthless piece of shit. I am a loser. I am, you know, I'm shot of all sort of confidence. And little did I know, it was probably creaking in, uh, creeping into other. Oh, that's that's Ricky Lewis. So that's my dad. Hello, boy. Oh, sorry about this. Just recording a podcast. I'm just recording a podcast thing. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, there we go. Anyway, that's giving it away. Where I'm, um, my mum was like, "Don't you dare tell anyone where you are." But technically, this is work, and technically, I've had to come back to Newbury to get a load of stuff for my drum lessons, and that is true. So, fuck you guys. It's fucking work. <laughs> anyway, um, so where was I? Um, yeah, so I just feel like absolutely shit, absolutely crap. So basically, uh, it got to September two thousand fourteen. The rent was up. Uh, I then got a job at pret a I hit rock bottom, I had fuck all money, I was borrowing money from my parents to pay for rent, they didn't have a clue what was going on, and I went, in September 2014, I went back to Newbury, it was about October, I think my good friend uh, Mick Baz, he knew about this, and he just said, Alex, you've got to move home, just move home, you've got to move home, so big up to you mate for that, that, um, that bit of advice at that time was 
um, priceless because you might go well that's obvious just move back home but I didn't think that I wasn't thinking like that pride was at stake I thought well I can't do this you know my mum was telling her friends oh you know he's running a car he's got a good you know he's making money for himself he doesn't have to work that much he's quite a successful guy you know successful quote unquote um, but I had to move home and I moved home with seven grand's worth of debt I was in my overdraft um, and uh, yeah it was it was a tough tough time um, but I got myself back on my feet, ever the optimist, I think all gamblers are optimists, sorry guys, I'm absolutely sweltering, like sweating, it's a proper like sun, su uh, sunny summer's day, or evening now, um, I moved back home, and I kind of got myself back on my feet, you know, I didn't have to pay rent, uh, my parents were very good to me, I didn't have to pay rent, I all of a sudden didn't have to pay rent in London, so, and the cost of that, and whatever, so... I set up another league for hot shots. Things were kind of look like I was kind of managing it and I stopped gambling. I actually kind of stopped uh, or so my bank account say. I don't know. have any idea. I can't remember if I would go into bookies or whatever. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's what I would do basically. Um, so, you know, sorry, I'm just trying to look through my notes where to kind of go next. Um, so, I, I yeah, I moved back home and it's all a bit blurry. I actually, you know, um, I actually stopped looking at my bank account records around this time because uh, just there was just so much in there. But 2015, 2016, there were other difficulties that came into my life um, to do with drugs and um, a, biz a, a failing business. Anyway, look, it feels like I've got the fucking violins out for myself. I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I've had it hard. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm no, no doubt that you've also had it hard um, in many different ways. I've had a very good upbringing. I've had a very supportive family very supportive girlfriend, it's cost me my relationship three or four times, um, but we're back together, uh, that's a different story, but anyway, um, actually on that note, I've really pissed my girlfriend off with what I said last week, um, anyway, um, so other stories, I mean, fast forward a few years, basically, I would then, I'd start gambling again, and there's a pattern developing. Basically, every time I would get paid with my drum lesson money, because I was self-employed, I would get paid for six weeks up front in advance, maybe 1500 two grand. But then that was kind of it. As I say, Hot Shots was my sort of weekly sort of cash fund, as it were. And um, I would, for example, I would go to Reading in the daytime, typically, just sporadically. I would go on a Monday or... Thursday afternoon, whenever, didn't really, you know, it would kind of come and go in these spurts, and I would go and just go to these casinos, and I got into blackjack, I thought, fuck it, I'm going to become a blackjack player, I'm going to, my mentality at the time was, I've done my training, I've lost so much fucking money from roulette, I'm going to become a blackjack player, now blackjack, a bit like poker, a bit like racing to an extent, is skill based, so you've got a chance to influence the outcome, so there is a bit of, there is an element of skill, and I thought, you know, I was watching loads of YouTube videos and these people saying you've got to count cards and all this sort of stuff. And I would go and it's sort of a similar story, but I was a bit more in control. I wasn't frittering like hundreds of pounds away. I was just frittering away like 50 quid or 100 quid. Because actually with Blackjack, you can sit and play it. You could play it for a few hours having only, you know, put 50 pounds down on the table. So it was good in that respect. Um, but... I remember at one point I was thought, you know, I'm going to become a professional at this. Like I've got, I've, I'm in control. I remember I went to Genting Casino, which is near the Reading Festival site. Um, again, on another afternoon, I put my cool jacket on. I thought, fucking hell, you know, I just felt like I was the fucking bollocks. You know, I thought, yeah, I'm a drummer. I'm like a cool kind of, I'm trendy. I'm cool. That was honestly my mentality. Went in there with 50 quid, 100 quid. And I spent hours, hours at the table uh, again, just leaving for a cigarette or going to the toilet, coming straight back. And I remember at one point when I felt particularly good, I'd had, I got up to about four or 500 quid in chips and I just had this unbelievable winning streak. I was, winning streak. I was just winning, 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 lose a bet, but win, win, win. And any person that's played blackjack will know if you look at your averages, you will every now and again have a really good winning streak. You'll also have losing streaks. But this was particularly good. And I felt like this is fucking great because the manager came over to watch the assistant manager came over to watch. And I th you know, they were obviously suspecting something. I was just using basic strategy. If any of you have played it, just using basic strategy. There's a good, uh, is it called 21 or the MIT um, University of Massachusetts? There's a good thing about how, to, you know, they were beating the system by basically counting cards and whatnot. Um, and I felt like the bollocks. Anyway, I should have walked out. I didn't. And I lost all of it. Lost 
every single penny. And I just want to say something, actually. Of all the times that I was in a casino, and this is even in a, um, even in a bookies, not once, not once did I get asked to stop. Not, and that's not being me being dramatic or whatever. I didn't, there was not one time that someone came over and said, mate, I think you should take a break. You should just leave the table. Not once, uh, which is shocking. So, you know, it's, it's the hypocrisy of the gambling industry and the legislation around it is bollocks. Tony Blair, sorry, getting political, a bit, bit of a rant. 2005, uh, the Gambling Act came in. Tony Blair basically said, right, you know, the new legislation that came in and said, TV uh, and radio allowed to, are now allowed to show gambling adverts, right? Basically, uh, 18% of adverts that you see uh, now, these days, are to do with gambling. Um, and gambling adverts went up 600% uh, from 2007 to, 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 to 2014. Um and, you know, the marketing of it is just ludicrous. You look at football uh, football teams, football shirt sponsorships, 10 out of 20 fo- uh, premiership football teams sponsored by betting companies. Um, is it 17? 17 out of 24 championship sides sponsored by betting companies. 32 red casino sponsor Wayne Rooney, um, Derby. Wayne Rooney, where's the 32 uh, number? You know, do not tell me for one minute that is to do with, you know, mar- you know it's not to do with the marketing of gambling. It's unbelievable britain has the biggest uh the largest unregulated unregulated it means you know you, you can fucking do what you want unregulated online betting um industry it's worth 5.4 billion pounds a year and there are over you know and this is the thing i could self exclude and this is what i then did i then self excluded it was a day i went to london on my own, I used the excuse to myself of I'm going Christmas shopping. I had about 150, 200 pounds to play with. And I went to uh, Mayfair, Mayfair Palm Beach Casino, a really fancy casino. It was on my own. It was, again, a Monday at midday. I went in at half 11, midday. I used to love it. You, they'd give you free coffee. It was fucking shit, little crappy flat white. But I get free coffee. Again, think I was the bollocks. Get blackcurrant and lemonade. Get treated like a king, you know, um women wearing next to nothing you know you know like red dresses which by the way the color red is used because it's seen as arousing um you know think red lipstick or whatever but i remember i fritted it all away and i actually said to the croupier and i said oh you know i'm actually here to do my christmas shopping she said oh um like do you not actually to be fair she did say i think you should go off and do i've just corrected myself i did she did say at that point i think you should just leave you know go off and do your christmas shopping so i got got told once to leave the tables i lost the whole fucking lot and i just tail between my legs i chain smoked a few cigarettes and just got the train straight back to newbury and it was that night that evening i rang up a casino i think it whoever it was and i just self-excluded i said i do not want to be in a casino again um and that was, I was about 28, 27, 28. So this, you know, this is a big period spanning my 20s, guys. You know, and, and in young men, one in four young men are at a risk of gambling problems. Um, you know, we get kind of hooked in with football bets. Um, you know, mobile phones, you can bet so easily. You can bet 24-7. Um, there are over 2,500 uh, online betting companies, and this is the thing. Sorry, I've got a bit sidetracked. I could self exclude from casinos; it was the best thing I ever did. But I couldn't self exclude uh, from online companies. I would still bet online. That was a fucking crazy thing. I would bet online, and it was the same kind of casino experience. I would play slot machines. I would play roulette. I played blackjack quite a lot. I played quite a lot of blackjack. Uh, so I was still doing it, still bloody doing it. But I kind of gave up. Um, <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> as I say, um, you know, it's it's a really really horrible thing, uh, gambling. Um, as I say, the brain the brain reaction is the same, winning and participating. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to sum up now, guys. I've got a few more facts um, to kind of talk about. Um, this I'm kind of as I say coming towards the end now. But um, uh, in the US, in the US. Uh, gambling is worth $500 billion per year. $500 billion per year to the government. 
and there are 23 million people in the US that go into debt because of gambling, and the average loss is £55,000. And I just want to leave you the, leave you with this in your mind, um, a couple of uh, well, a couple of points. Um, a point right now uh, that is about now, about lockdown, about coronavirus. People have got time on their hands. People are bored. Um, people haven't got much money because they've been laid off or they've been furloughed or whatever. Um, I have a worry that I'd love to, or I, I would love to know what the effect this will have on people and gambling. Will we see an increase? Uh, what are the profits like for these companies? You know, what is going to have, what's the impact on people's mental health um, with the gambling? You know, banks, you're, you, you know, bank, I had a message on my bank uh, statements today, or, you know, online banking. You know, we've changed our policy about overdrafts. You can go into your overdraft, no doubt. Uh, you know, people might not be earning money, but you're going to have to borrow more. And when you're vulnerable, when I was vulnerable and I didn't have money, I went and gambled. And I fear that the same was going to happen now um, with the population uh, in this country. And um, I want to leave you with this fact, which was um, quite a startling fact for me, actually. Uh, but there are 55,000 gambling addicts in this country aged 11 to 16. 55,000 gambling addicts in this country aged 11 to 16 years old, guys. This is a problem that needs to be addressed. I don't think it will be addressed because it's worth so much money to the government. Um, it's a subject that I don't think gets talked about that much. It doesn't get much airtime. Um, a couple of things I have watched recently on YouTube. Um, I don't know if you ever remember The Real Hustle. A guy called Alex, very good looking, kind of tall, dark, handsome Greek guy. He did a documentary worth watching that and really kind of figuring it out. What's it like to be a gambling addict? Watch Russell Brand, The Trues, five or six minute, really quick video. Um, there's another, do you remember there was an army army major? There's, he does a TED Talks for 15 minutes about his story and gambling addiction. This shit is real. It is a mental health problem, but only in 2013 it was given the same treatment as it were, quote unquote, as... Uh, um, is alcohol and drugs misuse. Uh, it is the invisible killer. Um, this podcast is dedicated to Lee um, and my uh, friend of a friend who recently uh, lost their own life. Um, and that's the thing. You, you know, you're the architect. You think that you're the architect of your own downfall. So therefore you think, well, the only person that I'm going to, you know, the, 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 the only person that I'm going to, get out of this is myself so the best way to do this is just killing myself I'll just kill myself and I have stopped gambling I can't really there wasn't really an end point um for me I think I you know I then went on to other things like um I then started to bet on like both teams to score and football and again trying to do sort of more like skill-based stuff um a good thing the government did was they reduced uh roulette machines uh, you used to be caught, used to do a hundred pounds per spin. You could bet a hundred pounds per spin in 20 seconds. Um, and they reduced that down to two pounds. I think that was good, but the problem they've got is that is essentially just shifted people's behaviors, uh, to, or, or the consumer's behavior to different things. Um, I think we don't really know the true effects of online gambling. I think that again, statistically, there are more people gambling on the people that gamble online 35 percent of them are problem gamblers or those at risk so i urge you if you are listening to this and you do like gambling just the next bet that you make just think i've listened to this podcast and i'm not going to make that next bet just that next bet that's all you got to do i don't don't think about giving up just the next bet just stop just just and that's the thing isn't it it's easy to say just stop and this is the thing the only person that's going to stop gambling is the gambler you have to want to stop and i was just so tormented by this for so many years it was just time to stop i was just on a self-destruct button um it was time to stop so i hope you've listened to this and you've taken something from it i apologize once again for the 10 minute blip at the beginning of me crying um but this has been stuff that i've not i basically kept myself um, not, I've never told, some of those stories have never been told ever, ever. 
Um, it is an illness. And I want to just finish by saying um, I want to support Gambling Cost, Gambling cost Lives. Um, it's a charity. I think it's a charity anyway. Uh, set up very recently um, by it's to support families that have lost loved ones from gambling uh, suicides. And um, I will be buying a T-shirt from Gambling Cost Lives. I'll leave the link in the description. Just have a look at that. Have just have a look at some of the stats. And the last thing I will say is if you suspect someone um, is gambling, uh, and this is, the, this is the fucked up thing. If you're listening to this and you are a problem gambler, you'll be aware of this. You'll be aware that you need to stop. You'll go, yeah, I need to stop. It's like smoking. You'll go, I need to stop smoking, but you still smoke. It's an addiction. But if you're a girl listening to this or, or whatever, speak. Ask to see the bank records, ask to see the bank statements, and that will tell you straight up, you'll be shocked. There'll be a horrible, horrible surprise. You'll, you'll look in there and go, fuck me, they've spent so much money. They've lost a lot of money. But this is a dirty, dirty secret of mine that I have been glad to share. This has almost been therapy for me. Um, I'm glad to get it out there in the open. I'm sorry this has been bloody long. I will usually keep to my half an hour podcasts. Um, I'm just going to flick through my... Uh, notes to make sure that I've kind of said everything I wanted to say Um, as I say I'll leave all the links in the description below thank you ever so much for listening Um, it means an awful lot and um, thank you basically Um, uh, it's um, it's been really really hard for me to get this out in the open Um, I'm not looking for your uh, sympathy Um, I want to just finished by saying it affects not only the gambler but it affects other people and I'm sorry I want to go on record and just apologize to all the people uh, my family and um, my friends I've lost good friendships um, I'd say I'm not looking for sympathy I'm just looking to raise awareness that's all I'm looking to do so <clears throat> um, I think I'm gonna leave it there You've been listening to Podcast 3. Thank you and good night.